Well, thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the NIMJIC president this year. Um, thanks to the NIMJIC board for helping organize these fall seminars. Uh, they've been going really well so far. This is number three out of four. Um, thanks, Raul, for coming to talk to us today. Um, we'll be recording today's talk for those that couldn't make it, and we'll post the, uh, the details and the link to the NIMJIC website shortly. Uh, if you missed any of the past talks, um, we've got the first week's talk up there on the website. Uh, I'm still working on getting the second talk by Zach Edwards up there, but that should be up there soon. So check back for that. Uh, if you need any CE, continuing education credits for today's talk um, for the GISP or another certification, just shoot me an email or shoot someone on, someone on the board an email and uh, we can get you a quick little letter for that. Uh, please try to keep your questions until after the talk today. Um, you can use the raise hand button on Zoom and we can call on you or you can type in your question into the chat window. That works pretty well too. Uh, please try to keep yourself muted during the talk and after questions we'll leave the room open for a while and we can just have an open discussion if anyone wants to participate. Um, before we get started, uh, Patty Dappen, our election coordinator this year, is going to announce the uh, NIMJIC board election winners. So go ahead, Patty. Yeah, thank you, Scott. I know everyone's so excited. I'm so excited to ex announce everyone. Um, for, you know, for this year's um, election, the five people that were elected to the NIMJIC board are Linda DeLay, Eric Fox, Brian Keller, Carrie Mitch, and Carol Platchy. Um, there were 86 ballots submitted, so we had good turnout for voting. And thank you to all that voted and congratulations to those that were elected. And also don't forget to vote for that next, next election coming up in November. Um, and thanks so much. Awesome. Yeah, lots of good important voting going on this year. Uh, thanks, Patty. Um, and thanks also to the outgoing uh, board members, Mello King and Kate Linzer, um, for serving on the board for the past couple of years. Um, all right, so let's get right to it. Today's speaker is Raul Campos Marchetti. Raul is a senior GIS and remote sensing specialist with over 36 years of experience in the field of GIS and remote sensing and its applications to the field of natural resources. He currently is the GIS manager for the Pueblo of Santa Ana, managing all PSA related mapping projects for the various divisions of the Department of Natural Resources, which includes water resources, Bosque and range, conservation officers and environmental department. He also works intimately with other Pueblo departments, including agriculture, tribal housing, planning and zoning, utilities, and in the maintenance of a Pueblo wide geodatabase mapping system. Raul is a FAA licensed professional drone pilot who flies and manages DNR's Matrix 600 Pro and the Mavic 2 Pro drones for the capture of digital orthophotography, digital surface models, and various ongoing drone and satellite based vegetation, terrain, and infrastructure characterization projects. Uh, today, Raul is going to discuss. AS drone technology and its applications at the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Roel. Thank you. Great. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Hope everybody's healthy and in good health and stays that way. Um, what I'd like to do today is uh, give you a, a taste of uh, the work that we're doing at the Pueblo of Santa Ana uh, using drones and uh, kind of give you an introduction of. Uh, kind of how we actually got into uh, drone mapping and the use of drones and the, the I want to say the many uses uh, that, uh, you know, I, wanna, I think I'm going to change my title from GIS manager to drone pilot because I've been so busy um, flying the drones. Let me give you a little bit of a quick introduction to the Pueblo of Santa Ana. The Pueblo of Santa Ana is uh, located uh, just north of Rio Rancho and, and part of it is west of Rio Rancho. The original Pueblo 
the Pueblo proper here, um, the, our 79,000 acres, that's our original Pueblo. Um, in 2015, the Pueblo actually doubled its size. They went out and purchased the King's, King Ranch, um, another 68,000 acres. So uh, uh, us in the Department of Natural Resources, DNR, we're responsible for mapping, maintaining, and doing all kinds of wildlife and uh, vegetation, et cetera, type research over the Pueblo Center. And, and it's quite a large area and a satellite imagery and drones have proved to be a big boon for us, especially with these new areas that, uh, you know, we completely have, we're starting from scratch in, in the new uh, Alamo Ranch area. Uh, so what is a UAV, UAS, U, UAS, uh, or a drone? Uh, we hear those words interchangeably, uh, UAS, unmanned aircraft system, UAV, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones. Uh, and really the drones, they range from, you know, little handheld drones all the way up to these uh, uh, literally unmanned jets, unmanned uh, aircraft. But we're really talking about uh, drones that are um, less than 55 uh, pounds generally. Uh, why, dr why drone technology? So, you know, why all of a sudden, you know, are we getting into this uh, technology? Uh, number one, and I, it replaces in some cases, I put the, the word many, I put the word many there for us because it, it's a big boon for us. But in some cases it replaces high, uh, resolution aerial imagery captured by aircraft, um, which, which can be very expensive. It requires a plane, a pilot, um, but the advantage is you can cover very large or relatively large areas. Um, again, one uh, disadvantage is you've got that one shot survey. For instance, uh, we're part of the MergeCog consortium, so we get half foot resolution uh, pixel data every every two years. Uh, satellite imagery now is at higher resolutions, uh, literally um, you know uh, one meter to two meter areas it covers large areas. Um, but the repeat, repeatability is limited for us even though we're part of the BIA, the tribe is part of the BIA program where we can get, satellite imagery for free. But um, again, each one of these serves a, a, dif a different purpose for us. A uh, drone imagery, uh, we can capture real time high resolution imagery at resolutions um, that should be actually uh, less than point, uh, no, sorry, greater than 0.25. So the minimum 0.25 inches, generally we fly two to one inch pixel resolution. Um, it's a one-time capture is limited to less than or equal to a thousand acres. Though I can, you know, there are times when I have a project and I'll fly that project um, multiple days, uh, maybe a week. And so I can increase that to five, you know, 8,000 acres. Um, but again, you can kind of see where everything fits in, you know. Uh, I can capture imagery any time of the year, to, you know, a, a, of course, depending on weather. Um, one of the important things for the tribe is that it can control its own high resolution imagery. In other words, there's a lot of information that we generate at the tribe within our GIS um, that, that is proprietary in nature, just like any other nation. Um, you know, our natural resources information, water, water rights information, et cetera, uh, addresses and location of homes, that's all proprietary data. And what the high resolution imagery allows us to do is to keep that proprietary. And again, uh, it's relatively low cost data acquisition and it's relatively low cost uh, to acquire these drones and sensors. And I am amazed, you know, having been in an industry for almost, uh, almost 40 years, I'm amazed that I'm doing stuff now um, that I was doing uh, that required, you know, aircraft, professional pilot and all that. So uh, I'm just amazed by, by this technology. As part of the uh, 
Pueblo of Santa Ana, these are these are my users. I act, they actually come to me and I provide data for mainly the Department of Natural Resources. But what's happened is this whole drone thing has exploded. So I'm working with tribal housing, transportation, agriculture, forestry. All of these guys are are my uh, uh, clients and users. So I'm uh, pretty busy now um, providing uh, data for uh, not only the Department of Natural Resources, but for various departments of the Pueblo. Let me uh, just do a really quick refresher on resolutions, um, just so you can kind of see some of the differences that we're talking about, both spatially and uh, spectrally, but mostly spatially. You know, I started out here with Landsat um, MSS, which was 100 meter pixel resolution, and then Landsat TM thematic mapper. This is a Landsat comparison of Landsat 8, which is a 49 meter pixel. We're looking at the Hyatt Resort on the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And so when we look at this uh, almost 50 foot pixel resolution, you can see, you know, I can I can make out the outline of the building, but there's really no, no detail. It's all pixelated. Spot 5, again, just another ex example of a, a satellite system that's out there, 33 feet. Rapid eye, you can see that the resolutions are starting to improve, 15 foot. Uh, quick bird, eight foot. Now we can actually make out some of the details in the building. We can kind of make out fuzzy cars and the pools and stuff. Uh, Worldview 2, which is a current satellite, Worldview 2 and Worldview 3, um, I can get a pixel resolution of 1.64 feet. Um, and again, I got a lot of detail on, out of this. So um, you can kind of see that you know, for us, satellite imagery plays an important part in everything that uh, we do at the Pueblo. And then uh, the Merge Cog um, digital ortho data set, which I, I think most of you are familiar with, half foot pixel resolution. Um, again, that's that's actually the Pueblo's uh, base imagery map. So this is our base map, and everything is uh, geocoded to that or geo referenced to to the half. A foot uh, data set. And again, um, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm zooming in on this pool here at the Hyatt Resort to kind of give you an idea of the resolution. So again, here's that Landsat. You can't make out anything except these four pixels. Quick bird at two feet. Um, we're starting to make see some of the outlines um, of, the, of the structure, at least, of the pool area. World view two, I can kind of see the pool water, but it's you know pretty much fuzzed out. This is a merge cog at half foot pixel resolution, and then below that is our uh, uh, this is a Mavic Pro uh, digital ortho mosaic uh, 1.5 inch pixel resolution. You can kind of see again what it looks like blown out. Uh, looks like when we look at the pool. And then again, I, I can zoom in and it's still, re even though it's a little starting to get a little fuzzy when I start zooming in, um, you can see the detail of chairs, the tables. I can even see the drains in the pool, which is crazy. Um, so this is the level of detail that we're really talking about um, when we talk about the, this drone data. This is Ma again, the Mavic Pro, and I'll talk about that, that sensor. But again, this is the level of resolution of data that we're talking about that we, we can work, that we're working with. Uh, again, here's a comparison of a merge cog image. This is along the Rio Grande. Uh, this is that uh, down tree. You can see again, it's pixelated. And not only can I see the uh, the tree in detail, but I can see all the mud cracks. I can see, you know, debris. In some of these images, I can even make elk uh, make out elk footprints. So uh, again, it's it's a, a a a huge boon for us in terms of pixel resolution. Um, at the Pueblo of Santa Ana, we really use the, uh, the, the full spectrum of data. Worldview 2 is, uh, you know, covers, I can cover the whole Pueblo with Worldview 2 data and do spectral mapping, vegetation mapping. So it, it's really a, a, the spectral base for, our, for, our for the Pueblo-wide data. The merge cog data is our cartographic base at half foot pixel, pixel resolution. And then the drone data, this is an image of our Matrice 600 Pro, um, really serves to fill in those high resolution studies, high resolution data sets that, that many of our, our clients need. Um, 
you know, again, this is a satellite image that we use at, at the Pueblo Worldview too. You can see that we have a complete data set. This is clipped to the Pueblo boundary. Um, it's it's uh, spectral, eight spectral bands, um, approximately 1.5 pixel resolution. And again, this, this was acquired um, July 13th. And again, tribes can get uh, this data for free part as part of the BIA ELA Digital Globe program. So I'm able to go online and actually search for this data and download it and again, use it for the Pueblo. And again, this is the admin area. You'll kind of see this a little bit just to, for perspective. Again, this is part of that BIA, I won't spend much time, but we're part of that BIA uh, Digital Globe program. And again, I can do a search, I can log in, do a search, and I can search uh, and for, for uh, imagery uh, over the Pueblo. Again, the merge cog data, that's our cartographic um, database. Um, again, as part as being part of the consortium, we were able to get that uh, data. Um, and again, it, it is the cartographic uh, base image base for all of our all of our projects, bo both on the Pueblo proper and uh, on the Alamo Ranch. And again, you can kind of see the, the, the spectral, the spatial and spectral resolution. It's an RGB. Uh, it's in the past, it's been an RGB data set. And now it's an RGB uh, near infrared data set that, that we can use. And again, here's just a, an example of the same thing. Here's uh, based on our Mavic Pro which we can gather resolutions between 0.25 and one inch. And again, there's uh, the admin area and zoomed in. Here's the pitcher's mound um, that I can clearly see. If there was a baseball there, I'm, I'm sure I could see it pretty clearly. Maybe even the seams, nah, maybe. <laughs> again, um, you know, we use it for natural resource mapping at this level of detail and then uh, for many of the clients, one of the, uh, you know, for housing, uh, a lot of the things that we're doing, roof inspection, you can see the resolution uh, of the data that we can clearly see the roof and some of the structures on the roof, et cetera. But again, just to give you an idea of the type of resolution that we're, we're dealing with. Um, how do we use drone technology at the Pueblo of Santa Ana? Um, probably I use it most as a digital orthophoto image-based creation where I can generate digital ortho photos at 0.25 to 0.2 inch pixel resolution. Um, and generally, you know, in a single flight with all five of my batteries, let's say on my Mavic 2 Pro, I can capture about a thousand acres. So again, there's a limit in terms of aerial size in terms of one single capture. But again, I can, I can build on that daily. And, and, and increase the sizes of those areas for various projects. The other really important boom that we're just really starting to touch is because we fly a stereo, um, we can create digital elevation uh, data sets in stereo, the traditional uh, uh, digital elevation stereo data sets. I can create digital surface models, which what a digital surface model is, is all the elevation points. And it's something that, um, you know, before we just cared about bare earth surfaces, but now, especially with this high resolution data, I can look at tree canopies, I can look at building footprints, I can look at, you know, detailed um, infrastructure like uh, the detention dam or uh, the retention ponds, the irrigation ditches. I can create elevation data sets for those um, at those very high resolutions. Also, Something that was very surprising for me is being able to do vegetation mapping in the visible, visible wavelengths and near IR wavelengths, and, I, and I'll talk about that. And then again, it's, it's in digital image base. I can do heads up digitizing of features, buildings, utilities, habitats, you know, and, and also it's a ground truthing tool for me in remote areas that are hard to access for my satellite image. Uh, analyses. Um, so what are, what are drone program requirements? We kind of went in this uh, feet first, but, you know, stepping back, um, you know, what are the requirements? First of all, you want to define the purpose of a drone program. Um, is it to provide um, information 
for your land information system or uh, to help other departments. Uh, the first stage I would say is to kind of do an evaluation of how and, and why you want to use a drone and justify it um, for the guys upstairs who want to know why do you want to fly a drone? We have aircraft data, we can get satellite data. And so really defining that purpose. Uh, and then for me, the first stage of the drone is to purchase a drone. Go out and you know, if you're really interested in a program, just go get one. Um, you know, we, I started out with a Mavic Pro, but you know, today you can get a Mavic 2 Pro with six batteries, the controller, the iPad, uh, its cases, and you can you can start learning how to use the drone. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, purchase drone insurance, and I'll talk about why you want to do that. Um, a lot of departments go out and purchase, you know, they spend five or $6,000 on a drone and you're learning how to fly. And three days later from, from the onset of getting your drone, it crashes. So make sure that you purchase drone insurance. Um, to do commercial work, um, it requires, um, first of all, it requires pilot training, training how to fly a drone. It's, it, you know, it's not a toy. It's an aircraft, um, you know, how to, how to, so you need to learn how to fly the drone in various conditions at various distances. And you also need to learn how to capture imagery and capture video. Um, you need to know about your airspace and the terrain that you're flying on. Um, and then you, if you're gonna continue this at the commercial level, then you need to attain an FAA drone pilot certification um, which is required for commercial work. And then, um, you know, implementing a mapping program. Our mapping program is implemented in three stages, the creation of digital ortho mosaics, digital surface models, and then the in integration of this data set and analyses into our uh, GIS. Uh, this is a picture of some of the commercial drones out there. I know that some of the federal folks um, all the federal folks right now are, are limited to not being able to buy what I consider, again, this is just my opinion, the best drones on the market, which are the DJI drones. Um, but there are a, there's a whole suite of drones out there that are made by um, different vendors, American and non-American drones. So, um, you know, choose your drones wisely. And again, you may be limited on, on, as to what drone you can get. Um, but I, I think the, the, the basic thing that you need, of course, is the drone. The drone requires, it needs to have an uh, onboard airborne GPS system, an onboard IMU. The IMU thing is crazy. I remember when uh, we first started, um, when I was with uh, Spectral Mapping up in Denver, you know, we bought our, an IMU that was $100,000. It was, you know, the size of a, of a, you know, big box. Um, now, now we have airborne GPS as an IMU on board, 4K digital camera that allows me to capture photo and video. Um, one of the things, again, I'm just going to go through this. One of the things that's required if you if you purchase a drone is that first of all it has to be uh, registered with the FAA if it's a drone that's greater than 0.55 pounds. So. Um, it's required to register your drone. It's only 15 bucks. Um, it's, it, it's a three year uh, registration that you can, you can just renew and they give you an actual certificate. It's, it's like getting a license plate for your car. Um, why drone insurance? Uh, you can look to the right and see why drone insurance. Um, because, you know, you, let's say you get your drone, you, you become really good at flying it. Um, drones can ha get signal loss. Uh, a drone can just, for whatever reason, um, every now and then, uh, except for this one time, you know, I've had, I've had my drones, they just fly away. In other words, you're flying a mission and your drone just takes off. And, you know, you, you, a mile later, you have to fly it back and figure out what's going on. And so because of signal loss and because of signals that may be out there that are being broadcast, um, your drone can, you can lose signal or your drone can fly away. And the result is your drone crashes. And that's my, my, my first Matrice 600 Pro. Um, it uh, flew away and it decided to land, but it decided to land in the trees in the bosque. 
Um, also, this pilot era, you know, you really need to spend time flying. It's an aircraft, um, like any other aircraft or, or like learning to drive a car, um, you can make mistakes. You can make mistakes based on uh, just not knowing what to do in certain situations that present themselves. You can make inappropriate decisions of, in terms of saying, you know, flying too far away from your, your controller and you lose signal. Um, that could be a hardware malfunction where your props can go. Uh, your software, communication software can go. So the result, drone crash. So make sure you get uh, insurance. Our Matrice, um, you know, is a $10,000 drone with all the batteries and all that stuff. We, we insure it uh, through the Pueblo. And, uh, and I got my replacement already. Um, what are some of the drone operator requirements? First of all, you got to be 13 years or older. Uh, the registrant must be a U.S. citizen or a legal permanent resident. Um, oh, we're required to fly at 400 feet or below. Always keep your unmanned aircraft in sight at all times, which um, hopefully the FAA doesn't come after me because I'm saying this. I, I don't always do that because of the mission that I have. Uh, I can't always do that. So, um, you know, I... I, I I usually have a, 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 an observer with me that looks looks at the drone where it's at. But you know, this, this is one of the issues for us who, who are collecting data is we're not always in line of sight of our drone during our project, but we're required to do that. Uh, never fly uh, near any manned aircraft or airports. If, um, you know, every now and then I'll get a, a manned aircraft that comes down and flies below 400 feet because they want to look at the old village or something like that. And man, it scares the crap out of me because my drone, I had a helicopter once come in and they landed kind of illegally at the Hyatt Resort and my drone was in the area and it freaked me out because, uh, you know, I almost hit them with my drone. So you have to be re very careful about aircraft in the air. You can't fly within five miles of an, of an airport. You can't fly over people or stadium or events. Um, you never fly, you know, your drone near a forest fire because uh, they'll get it. They'll take it under control and buy for your drone. Again, the, just like driving, you can't drive under the fly under the influence of drugs or alcohol. And always be aware of temporary FAA airspace restrictions. An example, the president might be flying in, so your airspace uh, restrictions have been changed. If you fail to register your drone or you do not have an FAA pilot's license and you're caught by the FAA, the fine is 250K or three, three years in jail. Now that's pretty loose. I've never had anybody from the FAA ever approach me or come to me, but I, they're, they're starting to really pop down on that. If you wanna become a commercial pilot, drone pilot, certified drone pilot, um, Here's the FAA regulation policy book. You really have to study for the test. It's the test is almost the same test as a man pilot takes. It, of course, it's not as intense, but you know you have uh, 60 questions that you have to answer. Uh, most of them pertain to. Um, there's my pilot's license. It's just like a regular driver's license. That's what it looks like. Um, you have to know about airspace. They want you to know, even though we're never gonna fly at class A or class B or C, um, you know, we fly in class G, G, which is this yellow down here. You need to know all of the, you need to know about all of these airspaces. The FAA requires you to do that. You need to know how to read an FAA av aviation sectional map. I'm a GIS guy. I've been, uh, you know, when I first started this, you know, I, I uh, been working with maps most of most of my career, um, and I looked at an FAA map, and I was like, "What the heck is all this stuff?" So you need to learn how to read an FAA map so that you know. Again, here's here's the city of Albuquerque, and these circles represent uh, restrictions of airspace. I'm really lucky because I'm way up here, and I have no restrictions. Again, the, this is the legend to that map. So there's a lot to that map. Um, airport symbols, airspace symbols, uh, 
towers, you know, radio frequencies. You need to know about all this stuff. Like I'm flying a drone. Why do I need to know about aircraft frequencies? They just want you to know that. It's just a requirement. Um, for those who, who want to study and get their commercial pilot license, um, my biggest boon for me was Prepware Remote Pilot. Um, and uh, it's, it's literally based on test questions from the FAA test. Um, and you need to know these areas, regulations, national airspace, weather, loading and performance and operations. So again, a lot of this has nothing to do with a drone, but the FAA wants you to know about that information. Again, here's the typical question, you know, look at this map, the airspace overlying within five miles of Brown County is what kind of airspace is it? So you need to look at the map, figure out where that is and then answer the question. So how do we start at, at Santa Ana? Uh, well, the way that we started is I bought my personal drone to work. And, you know, uh, one of the natural resource guys said, well, why don't you fly this sandbar over here? I, I need some imagery. I, you know, the, the two, 2018 imagery of, of Merchcog is, is not current. Go fly it. So um, two days, two or three days later, um, and literally about two months later, this is where we're at. This is where, what happened. Uh, we went, they, uh, my uh, director asked me to go and price out some drones. So we, we purchased a, <coughs> a Mavic Pro, which is this smaller drone and a Mavic Pro 2, <coughs> excuse me. And then the Matrice 600. Both of these I use for different purposes. Believe it or not, my workhorse is the smaller uh, Mavic Pro drones, sorry about that. And then uh, this, this uh, the, the Matrice, we use it for specialized projects because I can switch out the camera from RGB to near infrared. Again, here's uh, the Mavic Pro, the Mavic 2 Pro, which has this awesome Hasselblad camera, which is an amazing 4K camera, which just improved. That camera is actually better than my $2,000 uh, Zen Muse uh, X5 camera, I, I just get amazing spectral and spatial resolutions. And again, we're, it allows me to, uh, you know, fly an area, capture the data, generate orthos and generate digital surface models. Again, just I'm going to blow through this real quick, but just some of the, the stats, it's just a 1.64 pound drone, it can go 40 miles an hour. It, even though I can only, even though I can only go um, 400 feet legally, it has a maximum ceiling of 16,000 feet. So it's just an amazing aircraft. A single battery lasts for 27 minutes. It's got an onboard GPS. The still cameras are 4K. The video cameras are 4K. It, um, it has a, a gimbal stabilization for pitch roll and yaw. Um, and then I can I can do uh, I can capture data less than quarter of a of a foot resolution. Here's my Matrice 600 Pro, uh, the controller, the uh, the drone. It's a six prop drone. Um, it it requires six. It's got six batteries and six intelligent, uh, six props and six intelligent batteries. And again, that's my Zenus uh, X5 camera. Um, so, what software am I using um, to fly? I'm actually using Drone Deploy, which is a free freeware software that's out there that I, you know, I just load onto my uh, um, my iPad, and I use it to first of all create my flight plans. Um, it's the imagery that I actually use once I create my flight plan to actually capture the data. Um, you know. Again, this I don't know why I have this here, but I had my uh, initial test flight was a. Uh, uh, a flight that captured 59 images. Um, I use Lightroom, Adobe Lightroom, to visualize and review uh, and essentially quality control my data and the X EXIF files that have all of the uh, in the camera information and altitude, the roll pitch and yaw, the aircraft. And then I use Imagine. I'm a, a, an Earth Imagine guy, so I use Imagine UAV. 
uh, to process and create the digital ortho photo mosaics, the digital surface models. It creates uh, elevation point clouds in an LAS file format. And for me, it's very, very user friendly. Um, just so I, I want to give you a taste of just some of the, the projects that, that, that I um, work on. Again, this is a drone deploy, allows me to create my flight plan. And the flight plan can be any shape, create a polygon, any shape. Uh, it allows me to generate the resolution, et cetera. I use Adobe Lightroom to go in and check each image. Once in a while, you get an image dropout. Um, or you'll get no data and, and before you start processing, you really want to look at that and look at the header of the data to make sure it has all of the information required to make the ortho. Imagine UAV uh, it allows me to create the digital ortho. So here's my flight plan and here's my actual data that was captured. Um, it's amazingly seamless. It's just crazy. And it amazingly overlays directly over my uh, merge cog data. And then here's the digital surface model. And I use the word digital surface model because it has everything in it that's on the surface. The, the bare earth, uh, buildings, uh, the roads, trees, canopies. So all of that is in the data set, which um, is a great boon for me. So my first uh, project I, I was tasked with was to capture the administration area of the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And again, here's my flight plan. They wanted to capture the administration buildings, the wellness center, the baseball fields. They have awesome baseball fields. It's cr crazy. Uh, and then this new church that they, that they just built. And uh, well, they built it probably about three years ago. So there's my flight plan. Um, again, using drone deploy, and, and this is actually the drone deploy window here on, you know, I have the name of the project. It tells me once I create my flight plan, it tells me the flight's going to be 30 minutes. You're, you're flying over in an area that's 45 acres, your pixel resolution 0.6. You're going to, you're going to use two batteries, which is really important to know. Um, you, the aircraft's going to fly at an altitude of 175 feet. Um, you know, I have side lap and front lap 65, 75% because I want to, I want to capture uh, uh, stereo, the aircraft flying at 20 miles an hour and you're going to capture 22 images. So again, this is just information that once I make my flight plan, it, uh, it tells me what's going on. So that particular flight, um, and this is within the Adobe uh, uh, Lightroom. Uh, it captured 734 individual images. So that's a lot of imagery. Um, here, here's, a, again, just a, a map of that imagery, the distribution. You can see that four, three, those are actually the number of photos in that area that overlap. Here's my uh, metadata that's captured. It contains all the parameters of the camera. It contains a GPS uh, centroid location and the altitude, and it uses all of this information straight off the header of each individual photo to build the camera model uh, and, uh, and a terrain model. Here's an example of a single image. Um, I can see, uh, this is our administration building. I can see, literally see the, and this is fuzzy, but when I, when I actually look at it, it's very sharp. I can see, actually see the blades on the air conditioning. And again, here's my, uh, my my uh, uh, EX, EXIF file, the header file. So using Imagine uh, UAV, um, it plots the individual a, a, uh, GPS coordinates and camera angles and all that stuff for each image centroid. It creates a model of a surface model of that um, of, of the flight area, again, I'm, I'm just going to blow through this. Uh, UA, it's very, this is Imagine UAV, it's very uh, user friendly. Um, the input file, you, you have to figure out these parameters, but once you set them, they stay. Um, it generates a LAS file, point cloud, a digital surface model, and my orthophoto mosaic. Here's my orthophoto mosaic. One thing that you have to be careful about is, is give yourself some buffer because along the edges, the model starts uh, falling apart like all models do. So, you know, I always create a, a 
maybe a hundred meter buffer around, around the, the data set. Here's my elevation point cloud that's generated uh, uh, by the data set. This, again, this is a, this is a LAS file and these are, um, this is a point cloud data set. So the RGB data set has been assigned to each uh, elevation point in the cloud. So you got a lot of elevation points. Again, this is just the raw data, just you can kind of see the number of elevation points that we have. Again, just another view of that. And, and this fuzzy, crazy data over here, that's a, tr that's a, tr a tree. And again, I can generate a, a digital surface model and then uh, to the right, uh, a shaded relief. And one of the things that amazed me at first was that when I took my mosaic and I overlaid it over my uh, merge cog half foot pixel resolution data, it just dropped right in. It's just like, boom. Um, and you can kind of see where the drone data is and where the merge cog data is. Um, it, it's just amazing. So just some, some projects that, that uh, just a taste of some of the projects that we've been working on. This is the Tamaya Vineyard East. Uh, so Tamaya itself, they have a vineyard and um, uh, the GIS department played a big role. Um, again, these are the merge cog data sets 2012. Uh, when they started planning um, the, the vineyard. Again, you can kind of see that there's not much out there. Uh, 2014, there's the actual uh, vineyard area that's been uh, split up. And then today, it's part of our GIS. This is all of our infrastructure, the water lines, the shutoff valves, the pump, pump house and the wells. And then each one of these dots, uh, there's a total of approximately 29,000 plants and so we have mapped the location of each individual plant um, uh, for health reasons. Again, this is a drone shot of the, uh, of the vineyard itself. I, most of you probably never been up here. It's just gorgeous up on the Mesa, on the Pueblo lands. And again, this is I-25 to kind of give you perspective where this, where this is. So again, um, you know, we flew the vineyard for various purposes. One is as a digital ortho photo base. This is a, a color infrared. We took this with our, our Zenmuse, the Matrice uh, 600 Pro. Uh, again, you can see each individual plant. Um, and again, this is an analysis that we did using the near IR data. I created an enhancement of albedo, created an albedo image an NDVI, Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and a red index image, um, and which gives you a measure of biomass intensity. And from that biomass intensity, we analyzed the, the location of each individual plant. And we were able to come up with um, a map of where the vines themselves were in poor condition and where they were in good condition. So there were literally uh, almost 1,200 plant, plants that were in poor condition. Um, and he needed to pull those out and re replant those. And you can kind of see what that looks like on the ground. Here's, here's a row here, and you can see this row represents, I think, this row here. And you can kind of see, um, you know, those plants aren't doing real well. And in fact, there's a bunch of plants that aren't doing real well here. But again, it, it allows the vineyard guys, instead of going out manually and, and counting each individual plant and examining 29,000 plants, they can get a map that shows them uh, what, what vines are in good condition and poor condition. And again, that was a big boon for our guys. Uh, the detention dam, one of the things that we use this for is for infrastructure mapping. Uh, our guys wanted a high resolution map, um, higher than the half foot resolution that the merge cod gives you. Um, again, this is uh, the flight plan um, and, and the information required, you know, that, that, that it gives me, it's a 27 acre area, 30, 30, approximately 32 minute flight. Again, here's, here's my captured images. Here's my uh, each individual image. And again, this is the resolution of the data. 
where you can actually see on, on the, the detention dam, you can see uh, pebbles and cobbles in there. Uh, and then here's my digital ortho overlaid onto my merge cog. Again, it just fits, it just, just boom, just falls right in there because of the nature of the airborne GPS and IMU data. It, it just fits right in there. There's my a shaded relief of my elevation data set. Here's an image with me looking out. You can almost make out my face. You can see my koofy on the top of my head and my uh, drum box. And again, here's my digital surface model. And some 3D perspectives of that surface model. So here's, uh, again, the, the LAS point cloud. And then this is a 3D perspective of the uh, of that same point cloud. And again, just to me, it's just amazing elevation detail. And, and the number of elevation points is just outrageous. Again, another infrastructure project, they wanted us to map the irrigation ditches. This is the Indian ditch, one of the main ditches on, on the Pueblo. Um, again, that's a digital ortho. That's the digital ortho overlaying onto our, um, G in our GIS with the merge cog as a base and our agricultural fields. And with our engineering data, again, the, you can see the ditch, the digital surface terrain, surface model. And again, here's the, the point cloud. And again, excellent detail, elevation detail along that. Um, here's uh, the Vulcan sand pit. Um, that Vulcan, uh, we have a, a gravel mine, a gravel sand a mine that uh, Vulcan is closing. So one of the things that they did was they were just gonna walk away and not really do any true reclamation and uh, the tribal council just had a fit. And so they had us fly. Again, they, they have these slopes that are kind of dangerous and it's a big hole, a big pit. Um, they had to recla reclaim any slopes greater than 27 degrees. Here's my, uh, again, my drone imagery, 600 Pro of the, of the, of the mine overlaying the merge cog. And then these are all slopes within the blue area. These are all slopes that they had to fix. So again, without this drone data, um, you know, we would have to have to do an expensive flight um, to have to have and collect this this present this current data. And uh, and again, they're in the process right now of fixing those slopes and making them manageable. Um, a completely different application. Again, I'm just going to show you what what's happened. Um, drone roof inspection, uh, there's over 200 residential homes on the Pueblo. Um, one of the things that they do is they have a guy climb up on the roof and he has to go and inspect the whole roof and it, it just takes forever. Um, here's a drone shot of the roof and we take it at uh, various angles. And again, you can, you can look at the detail of, of the roof and you can see where the roof repair is required. Um, and this just makes the job for our um, uh, building guys just so much easier. Again, a good part of the roof. Um, and again, here's that part of the roof. And again, this is zoomed out. So when you zoom in, you can see, you know, you can see individual tiles and what tiles need to replace and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, on the roof. Uh, again, another area. And again, just another area where we're helping the Pueblo. Uh, Environmental, right now we have a, a cottonwood die-off on the Rio Grande, um, on the Pueblo. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is uh, spectrally, we're looking at the blue, the green, the red chlorophyll absorption and the near IR. But with my RGB drones, um, I can actually look at just at the green, the blue, green and, and red and do some crazy analysis. Why? Um, because I have no atmosphere. I'm, I'm below most of the atmosphere. And so I can get that nice peak, that nice absorption in the, in the blue, the green peak and the red chlorophyll absorption. It just, it's just really clear. Um, so I can use this part of the spectrum. If you were to look at satellite data in the blue, those of you that work, this number is, is like maybe 160 because of the blue scattering and, and it, pretty much, unless you do go through and do atmospheric corrections and all that's pretty much useless. Again, here's a, a, a ortho mosaic of the, of the, uh, the die off. Again, here's the die off um, 
area photographed with the drone. Again, you can see there's just uh, cottonwood skeletons on the ground on the ground. So one of the things I was able to do was build a use, I created a Sobel filter model of the down trees so that I can create a, a model, a fuel model for, for those trees, uh, for the dead skeletons that are on the ground. This is what it looks like in 2001. This is a NHAP color IR, nice, healthy forest. Um, this is taken with the Matrice 600 Pro. You can see that there's a large portion of the forest is gone but also it's thinning. So we wanna to monitor to that and keep that going. Uh, again, this is a, a classification of the trees, a spectral classification in that particular area. Not only do we get the location of the trees, but I also get tree height from my digital elevation data. So this is actually a map of the location of cottonwood trees and their elevations of the canopy. Agriculture, again, the agriculture department, we fly every year and we map all the fields that are fallow and the fields that are, that are um, active. And again, these are statistics that our ag department needs for, uh, for itself. Um, this is, uh, again, another environmental study. This is the sandbar, what we call sandbar one. Uh, that's a big habitat area. Uh, along the Rio Grande. Again, this is the MergeCog 216 uh, data set. Um, again, this is the MergeCog data. And here's the, the, you know, again, you can you can barely make out these areas of, of where they planted trees, but you can clearly see the circles, you can clearly see the canopy um, and differences even in the color of the vegetation, which um, I use to, to, to do spectral mapping. This is an area, uh, again, that uh, we flew. This is the drone imagery at uh, almost an inch pixel resolution of it needed to map, uh, needed to identify Russian olive, which is an invasive species in this particular sandbar. Uh, again, I created an enhancement um, using remote sensing techniques where I created an albedo, a green vegetation index, and a red minus blue uh, index and this is the image that I get. And man, those uh, Russian olives have a very unique spectral response and all this pink, they just pop out. Um, and again, this is just RGB. Um, and again, uh, working in feature space where I'm looking at the, the blue index versus the green index, I can, I can look at the distribution of features in terms of feature space. And again, here's my Russian olives. They cluster out in, in a very, they just cluster right out based on the spectral response in the visible. Here's my cottonwoods, here's water, sandy soils, et cetera, et cetera. And again, this is uh, the equations I use to build that, that enhancement. And then there's my map, um, my GIS polygon map of my uh, Russian olives that they'll go out and uh, remove. Um, again, mountain lion guys, uh, we have mountain lions on the Pueblo, um, and we put GPS collars on, 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 the, uh, on the mountain lions. Here's one of our wildlife drinkers uh, that we put out there for the animals. And so this is the home range. These, are, these actually represent GPS points. They, they spend a lot of time on the Hemes River, but they, they got a big roaming area. So th those people that live in uh, Rio Rancho, be aware that mountain lions are real close. <laughs> and so uh, when a mountain lion uh, spends a few days in a particular place, and these are GPS points, and this particular uh, mountain lion is called Broken Leg, um, you know that they, the, our range guys know that there's been a kill. And so they want to monitor what did this actual mountain lion kill. And this is on top of the mesa up there in the middle of nowhere. So it's really hard to get to. So they gave me the GPS coordinates and I, uh, you know, flew my drone out there specifically at that GP to, to that GPS location. Here's the GPS location where, where um, my, drone, my drone went. And so you can see as I as I zoom in, as I start decreasing my elevation, you can see that it was a horse kill that the mountain lion um, actually killed. And again, that, that's just 
vital information for our rangeland guys. Um, so that's, that's just kind of a, a, a summation of, of how we're using the drones um, on the Pueblo of Santa Ana. And uh, hopefully it gives you an idea of how the drone can be used. Um, and these drones are very sophisticated. They, it is an aircraft. Um, I can take digital imagery that spectrally in many ways um, is better than some of the aircraft imagery that I can capture in terms of spatial resolution and even some of the spectral resolution. Um, and uh, it's just been a boon for the, for the GIS department and, uh, and the various departments of the Pueblo. Awesome, thanks so much, Raul. That was, that was really cool. Uh, does anybody have any questions? Yes, I do. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, uh, can you do any real time? Oh, Wait, real when you time say photography or real time video? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yes. In, in other, when, when we fly, we're flying real time. So, you know, we, we either fly a, a flight plan or I can fly a video real time. I can take my drone and just, I, I wish I had uh, the software, but to show you the imagery, but I can fly my, my drone real time, let's say for emergency purposes. In fact, there was a, there was a crazy guy on I-25 that was shooting at people and uh, the police department asked me to fly my drone to see if we can locate the guy. I couldn't locate the guy, but you know, that's the kind of real time stuff that you could do. Um, how, how far and how long can you fly real time? Um, Real time, I can fly for about 27 minutes on a battery. Um, and I can fly up to technically, again, this is out of my line of sight, which I'm not supposed to do. But technically, I, I can fly four to five kilometers out. And okay. I've had to do that for certain certain things, certain projects. If, if, if you don't mind, after the presentation, you know, I mean, next week, next month, whatever, man, I'd like to get with you and discuss some ideas that I have. Sure, sure. I mean, it's a new, it's a brand new technology that I think it, it, it's a boon for anybody that's doing GIS or any kind of mapping. Um, and uh, it pays for itself. It paid for itself in a month. I want to say it paid for itself on the first project. Literally, because um, cool. you know that that Mavic Pro was about 3K with with everything, and you know, imagine having to get an aircraft and fly the administration building and all that stuff. Yeah, it's expensive. Cool. Thanks. Well, thank you. That was a great presentation. Uh, I had a question. Do you use like an RTK system, or is the internal GPS on the Mavic Pro good enough for what you're using or your application? So far, um, the the Mavic Pro has been good enough. I mean, again, my, our, my base is the half foot pixel resolution merge cog. So really everything needs to fit to that. I haven't, um, I, I'm, I'm able to go out and use, um, uh, you know, ground control points, but I don't even do that. For most for most projects, it just fits right in, and and you know the airborne GPS, the IMU controls all the uh, pitch and yaw. My Matri 600 has three redundant um, GPS systems and three redundant IMU systems, so it's it's just really pretty accurate. You know, I, if you were doing some kind of uh, engineering survey and all that, I would say, yeah, you need to, you know, our RTK points in and. and but for most of the natural resource things that we're using it for, I, I, I don't have to do anything. Once in a while, I'll have to do a little geo, geo correction, but I would say 95% of the time, the data just falls right in. And, it, and it's because, you know, I, I'm taking 711 images, let's say. And so you have 711 GPS and IMU locations. And they, you know, it's just a really tight, Fit. You saw the elevation data, how many points I actually have. You know, I have a point every quarter inch or every inch or every two inches. It's just crazy. Awesome. 
We got time for a couple more I have, questions, I think. I have, oh, mine's oh. really quick. Can yeah. I ask one more? Yeah, go for it. Bro, do, does it matter? Uh, do you, do you um, the time of day? Like, is there certain times of day when you see more detail on the ground than others? Um, no, I, I mean the detail is always the same. But the, it's the issue with flying any any aircraft. You want to minimize shadows. Um, yeah. So you know, okay. between ten thirty and two o'clock are the prime times to fly. So, you know, if 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 shadowing is the issue, like if you're doing vegetation mapping or any infrastructure mapping, where shadows are going to cover things up. So yeah, there is there is you know you're, you're limited to the same kind of uh, uh, time frame as you would with any aircraft that's flying. Um, if shadows are are an issue, and they and it is usually most of the time. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Roe, uh, great presentation. This is Sue from EDAC. I have a quick question for you. Uh, yeah. You hi, hey, hey Roe. So when you fly a mission that uses multiple batteries. Yes. Uh, so is that, I know you are using drone deploy for the flight control and flight planning. So yes. if the battery is going to almost empty, is that the automatic flyback? And then when you change the battery to continue fly? The yeah, no, what, what's amazing with these drones is first of all, it, it keeps track of the battery um, level. And then when it, let's say it flies out two kilometers, it, it calculates and knows how much time it's going to take to get back. And it always keeps track of that. So um, if I exceed, I'll, I'll set it to, you know, I, I can set that. But if it exceeds the battery power that it, it needs to come back, it automatically comes back. And then I can change out the battery and it'll continue the flight plan where it left off. Oh, OK. Thanks. Yeah. How are you? <laughs> oh, I'm doing well. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We got a couple of questions on the chat when I want to make sure we get to them. Um, Matt Bandy asks, what are you using for point classification uh, that is ground or non-ground points to generate your DTMs? Well, I'm, I use a software called Mars uh, that's generated by Matt Merrick and it allows me to, to create, um, it allows me to basically classify elevation points. Um, so I can I can separate out my veg from my uh, surface points. The other thing that I do is uh, a lot of times I'll classify an image, and then I'll use the classification of the building, let's say, to extract out the building points. And it, it can be a little, you know, need some editing, but um, again, at the level that we're mapping for our GIS, um, it works pretty good right now. But that's an issue if you it, it captures all of the elevations in your image imagery. So if you're interested in a nice, beautiful bare earth surface, um, you're gonna have a lot of work. But for, for us, we, you know, we, we, we have access to the MergeCog LiDAR. We also uh, have 2018 a LiDAR, a FEMA LiDAR. So we really use that for our bare earth surface. And we use our drone elevation. I use it mainly for building footprints and for uh, extracting uh, vegetation canopies, which is uh, really important for us. Okay, very cool. Uh, Kate Linzer asked, do you get much noise in the point clouds or DSMs produced by the Imagine software? It's relatively, I'm gonna say it's relatively clean. I don't get a lot, whole lot of scattering. I don't get a whole lot of bad points. Um, it's just a nice data set. It's just crazy, okay. but you, you do have to clean clean it up a little bit for sure. I mean, like any any data set, like the, any stereo or lidar, there's always some kind of noise. Sure. All right. Uh, any reason you selected the Mavic Pro versus the Phantom? Uh, one was price. Uh, the other, well, it's funny. I had I have a friend who has a, a Phantom. Um, I think the Phantom has a little bit better camera. Not anymore because there's a Hasselblad camera on the Mavic. It just seemed to me, you know, hold on a second. Show and tell.
you know, uh, the, the Phantom has some kind of issues when you store it, you gotta take off the propellers and all that. I mean, here's my, here's my personal Mavic. I don't know if you can see it. This is my personal Mavic Pro. And, you know, literally, it, I can take this anywhere. I've got my little case. Um, I can put this in the, my backpack, you know, just undo it. And, you know, and she's ready to go. Can you guys see that? It, I, I just think it's, uh, I was more comfortable with the Mavics. And uh, and my only complaint at the time was the the Phantom 4 had a better camera, but now with that Hasselblad camera on the Mavic 2 Pro, I, I don't even look at the Phantoms anymore. Hi, Raul. This is Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi. Yeah, I use both uh, the Phantom 4 Pros and the Mavic 2 Pros. Uh -huh. And the thing I like about the Mavic is the low profile. It yeah. seems to be more stable in the winds. It's more stable. Yeah. yeah, the phantoms get a little bit of drift, you know, yeah. as yeah. Yeah, I mean, if you look, if you're able to look at the video, when I stop, it's, it's like I'm looking at a still. It's just amazing how, how stable it is. And again, the Matri 600 Pro is just another level of, of drone. It's a, a little bit more complicated, bigger, you know, it's, it's a hassle to take out to the boonies. Um, and the Mavics are just so easy to deploy and fly and, and the data is just amazing. All right, awesome. Uh, let's see, we got a couple more if you got time, Raul. Um, yeah, no problem, I, I can hang. Okay, uh, Stephen here asked, how did you sell the Pueblo leadership on starting a drone program? Uh, well, you know, selling stuff to tribal council is always difficult, but um, I think they immediately saw the advantages of, you know, uh, the cost. One of the things was, what is the cost of aerial photography versus, you know, uh, the, the cost of purchasing a drone, um, uh, being able to show, and there were issues. There, there were, uh, you know, oh, you're flying over my house. You're going to spy at me, and you know, on on tribal members that are there. So, you have to you have to take some time to one educate. I started really with educating the department, and then, um, you know, our director essentially sold it to the pueblo. And and it wasn't very much. It was literally two months later. Um, that they said go go buy a drone and and we got permission from the pueblo so um it, it's an education you have to sit down and and educate i had to educate my own department on the uses how it could be used because they were very you know some of the guys range guys were real skeptical um but you know the the proof is in the data itself and uh and essentially uh our director sold it to the tribal council Awesome. Okay. Uh, any, let's see. One, well, one, of, one of the big, one of the big cells was proprietary that, you know, um, you know, when you, when you, when I fly merch cog, any, everybody can see the Pueblo, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. there's no restriction. It's public domain data, but um, you know, this data becomes proprietary and it doesn't go outside the Pueblo uh, unless, you know, this, this some sort of sharing agreement or something like that. Um, so the proprietary nature of high resolution data was a big sell. You guys can control it. That's a big, big difference. Yeah, yeah, no, and, and, uh, and uh, you know, a lot of the tribes are very, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Conservative in terms of letting data go out just because of historical things and all that, so. Yeah, absolutely. All right, a couple more here. Uh, Tara Spurlock asks, why not uh, use Pix4D? Have you tried Pix4D? Um, I did, um, but you know, I'm an Erdas Imagine guy. So uh, I, I, I stuck with the Imagine products. Now I know that uh, there's Pix4D, uh, even um, Esri now is starting to get into their, uh, into, into this area, um, but, uh, I mainly stuck with uh, 
imagine because I already had that suite of software and then just added that um, that software suite to my to my entire suite and uh, and I'm really happy with it. Pix4D, um, you either it, it's a monthly uh, subscription, um, which I don't, I don't want to do monthly subscription or um, you know you have to pay 10k for the software. The, the Imagine software is not cheap either, but you know I'd, I'd have to buy this. I had to convince now the Pueblo I need this 10k worth of software now, um, when really I just needed to buy a, an addition to my existing software. I think you really need an intern. <laughs> I, I'm convinced. Yep. <laughs> I'm I like I said before. Uh, I think I'm going to change my title to drone pilot because my GIS manager position is decreasing every day. I fly drones too, yeah. but I use but I use Pix4D and I've never had the opportunity to use the any Erdos products. But I would like to see it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I've been. I mean, I've been an Erdos guy since 1984. So. Uh, I know is, is coming out. They just came out with it, which I haven't looked at at all. They're coming out with uh, their own digital ortho photo software um, for, for, for drones. So they're not cheap. The, the, the ortho photo software is probably the most expensive part of this whole deal. All right, last one here, and we'll leave it here. Uh, does the Mavic Pro have built-in IMU when you purchase yeah. it? Yeah. It has a built-in IMU and built-in airborne GPS. Okay, yeah. awesome. And then it records all that data so that when you put it in your uh, uh, digital ortho model, it does all the corrections, you know, roll, pitch, yaw, position, um, corrects for altitude. So it, it truly is a... Uh, um, Again, I, I sometimes sit down and can't believe that I'm doing stuff that required hundreds of thousands of dollars of equipment and personnel uh, to do. Again, there's a limit in terms of um, the amount of area that you can capture um, at any one time or any one flight. But right now, I'm I'm building um, I'm building up my digital ortho data set that right now covers all of the vi villages, all of the business. Uh, areas. So, um, you know, it, it, and, and then I, what I would say is that because a lot of people, um, uh, what I find is, you know, you, you see this thing, you think it's a toy, you know, you're flying it and people are saying you're flying this toy drone, but um, it's not a toy. It, it's an aircraft and it, uh, you know, you have to learn how to fly it, otherwise you'll lose it. Um, and it can be, you know, fairly expensive. Like I said, I, my, I had a flyaway of, of my $6,000 Matrice and it crashed um, and I had insurance, so it took care of that. But, um, you know, it's a serious thing. You, to learn how, you need to learn how to fly it. You need to know how to acquire imagery. You need to learn how to, um, you know, certain situations come up, like what What do you do um, when an aircraft enters, enters your airspace? What do you do when you lose signal? Um, and each one of those has its own kind of panic. Um, and you have to, you kind of have to be level-headed and just, you know, figure out what's going on and bring your aircraft back. Yeah, makes sense. All right, well, thanks so much, Raul. This is really- Oh, you're welcome, cool. guys. Knowledge, yeah. Um, that concludes it for today. Um, thanks everybody for joining us and.